Good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Dan here at Rexmont Church in Rexmont, Pennsylvania, the southern end of beautiful Lebanon County, Pennsylvania. I want to welcome you to our worship service this morning here at Rexmont. Uh, we are continuing in our sermon series on the minor prophets, and uh, today we're going to be in Haggai. So if you have your Bibles, uh, either a, a, a book Bible or maybe a Bible app or something, go ahead and turn to the book of Haggai. We're getting close to the end of the Old Testament, um, and, but uh, we've got a couple more weeks to go. But uh, turn in your, your Bibles to the book of Haggai. We'll get there eventually. While you are turning in your Bibles, I want to tell you something uh, about me that if you know me, it's been probably not going to be a surprise. <laughs> um, I and, and I'll be honest with you, I have never uh, had this tested. I don't know for sure, but um, I, I think I'm pretty sure I have ADHD. <laughs> surprise! <laughs> uh, because most of the time when I'm teaching, and I've been a teacher now for 25 years, when I get a kid that comes into the classroom um, and they have ADHD and they've been diagnosed with it, uh, I like, yeah, that's that's me. I, that, that, that kid there, that, that's me. <laughs> so so I know what ADHD looks like and I know what I look like. And I'm like, mm, yeah, yeah. One of my favorite uh, movie characters of, I think, all times. Uh, also has ADHD, and uh, that movie character is uh, Doug the dog <laughs> in the movie Up. Um, I, I don't know if you've seen that movie or not, but uh, Doug is a dog, and he's very flighty, and I love you, and I want to do everything and play and all this other stuff, and then all of a sudden he sees a squirrel, and he's like, laser focus, squirrel. And he focuses in, and that's that's what I am. I am a Mr. Procrastinator Extraordinaire. I don't want to do anything. It's like pulling teeth to get me to do something. Every once in a while, though, something piques my interest and laser focused in on it. And I always tell people if I am working and doing something like writing my sermon or something, and uh, and and I'm I'm really into it. Please don't interrupt me because if you interrupt me with a question or something, whew, there it goes, and and it will take me forever to get back into to working. Um, when I was growing up, I was probably in oh I'm guessing eighth grade, ninth grade, something like that. Um, we had at RVA a, a thing called Pinewood Derby. Uh, Pinewood Derby is uh, uh, an event where we built our own little wooden cars, uh, and then we raced them down this long wooden track. Um, I, th this picture is; these pictures are from just a couple of years ago, not from back when I was a student. But that's the the track. You can see the track and the cars here in the in the left hand side. Kids lined up waiting to see their car run down the track, and it was a great time uh for the school to get together and and have a good time on race day um but when i was in eighth or ninth grade i i bought a pinewood derby car uh, actually i charged a pinewood derby car to my parents account at the school and uh then my uh, ADHD took over and I just didn't didn't particularly do anything about it for several weeks while everyone else was building their cars and stuff. I was like, eh, you know, I'm, I'm not into it quite yet. Um, and uh, I, I finally decided it was a couple of days before the race. Uh, I'm not going to bother doing it. Um, the night before the race. Um, my uh, father says to me, uh, so how is your Pinewood Derby car coming along? And of course, I'm like, eh, I didn't, I didn't do one. And he said, no, no, no. You charged that to our school account. We paid for it. You are going to do a Pinewood Derby car. I'm like, oh, man. So I started working on it. I was like, mm, I don't want to do this. No, 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 no. But, then, but then I got into it. And that night, I put together a, a pretty cool car. Um, took it to race day the next day. And surprise, surprise, it was pretty fast. 
my best friend, whose name also happened to be Dan, we were Dan squared all growing up, not because we were squares, although we were, but that's neither here nor there. Um, uh, he and I, he would win one race, I would win the next race, he would win one race, I'd win the, win the next race. And eventually it turned out that I actually won first place speed for my age group. Uh, I have the trophy. It's uh, in the church sanctuary. I'm going to show it to everyone uh, during during the church service. I didn't bring it in here for you guys. But it's just one of those things that I procrastinated, procrastinated, procrastinated until someone came along and went, get to work. And that's actually what we're going to be talking about today with the prophet Haggai. The first part of this story of Haggai is very similar to my story of procrastinating. But of course, the stakes were, were much, much higher than just a, a wooden car race. And instead of procrastinating for a few weeks, like pre creating my Pinewood Derby, uh, the, the people put off their work for 18 years. And through the prophetic voice of Haggai, the people got called into the, the boss's office, the Lord's presence, and are told, get things done. Before we begin uh, the Haggai short book, I want to give you the back story. The historical setting, the historical timeline, I think is so crucial to understanding uh, Haggai's words. And, and we get this, I'll get this information out of Second Chronicles, 2 Kings, the book of Jeremiah, the book of Ezra, all talks about this time period. Um, from, from the time of Solomon on, um, the, the most of the kings of Judah led the people astray. Uh, and, and so the Lord had promised them uh, or had threatened them with judgment. If you do wrong, then you will be judged. There were a few good kings in the southern kingdom of Judah, but even those good kings weren't able to lead the people completely in the God's way. And so finally, uh, God brings to the nation of Judah judgment in the nation of, of Babylon. And in 607 BC, Babylon, the nation of Babylon is, is marching, and they're marching from Babylon down the uh, Great Coastal Highway and the King's Highway. They're marching through the Fertile Crescent on their way to attack Egypt. And as they go down through that area, they have to stop and conquer every country and city in between Babylon and Egypt. Jerusalem being one of those. And so in 607 BC, uh, Jerusalem falls to the Babylonians. Um, <clears throat> and, and when Babylon conquers Jerusalem this first time, they take a, a fairly large group of people and send them into exile, send them back to Babylon for a while. Uh, people like uh, Daniel and uh, Shadrach and Meshach, Abednego, Ezekiel are all people that were taken from Jerusalem and shipped back to Babylon in 607 BC. In uh, 597 BC, the Babylonians are now coming back up from Egypt and uh for whatever reason, in the last 10 years, the, the kings of Jerusalem had decided to rebel against Babylonian uh, authority. And so in 597, Babylon again attacks Jerusalem and attacks it and it they conquers it. They take more prisoners with them back to Babylon. Now, uh, not having learned their lesson about let's not antagonize Babylon and rebel against them. In 586, they rebel, uh, the city of Jerusalem rebels again. Um, and this time, uh, Judah, about when Babylon comes back, they decide they're tired of coming back. And so they wipe the city of Jerusalem off the face of the earth. They destroy the walls. They burn the city. The temple of God that had been built by Solomon some 400 years earlier was completely destroyed. 
But that's not the end of the story. About 50 years later, in 539 BC, Babylon itself was defeated by the Medo-Persian Empire. And the uh, Medo-Persians become the new de facto uh, rulers over the Jewish nation. And a year later, uh, a remnant of about 50,000, 49,000 or so Jews returned to Jerusalem and Judah, sent from the Persian emperor, King, uh, King Cyrus. Uh, this return was led by people like Ezra and Nehemiah. Quite a few Jewish people, however, did remain in Babylon, most notably Daniel, who became a, a leader in the Persian Empire, as he was in the Babylonian Empire, even though he was Jewish. Uh, and it was during this time period when, when uh, Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. He was uh, probably around 80 years old at the time that he was thrown into the lion's den. Um, those that did return to Jerusalem um, uh, built the walls around the city and, and built an altar at the location of the temple. They even actually began to build the temple. But then some opposition arose to them building, rebuilding the temple from people who had been living in the community for the last 80 years who were not Jewish, that felt threatened by these uh, Jewish people coming back and laying claim to the, the land again. And so because the opposition rose up, the the people of, of Jerusalem and Judah stopped building the, the temple. And then their procrastination or, or their ADHD, I don't, I don't know, uh, set in and they made no effort to restart construction for another 18 years until finally the Lord sends Haggai to get things uh, moving again. Uh, and that's what's going on all before the time of Haggai. Among the returning exiles were the prophets Haggai and Zechariah. Uh, Ezra 5, 1 through 2 sums up for us what these two uh, contemporaries accomplished. It says, now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, a descendant of Edo, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shittil, and Joshua, son of Jodzak, set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. So Haggai and Zechariah were sent by God to assist in the rebuilding of his house, the temple. In our various discussions on the minor prophets, we've talked about the background of all of these prophets and have often said, now we think they ministered around such and such a time in history, but we don't really know. Not so with Haggai. In fact, we actually know the exact date that the people of Jerusalem began to rebuild the temple. The work was begun, according to Haggai 1.15, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius, which, when we put it into our modern calendars, is September 21st, 520 B.C., the exact date. It is uh, difficult to get much more specific than that. I mean, I guess he had said, you know, on the morning of or in the evening of or something like that. But but other than that, this is this is it. Uh, about 18 years had gone by between the return of the exiles and the rebuilding of the temple. And, and this delay is what brings forth the message of Haggai. The way Haggai motivates the Jews to build the temple of God has, has, I think, a powerful application to our own efforts in building God's church here on earth. Not our physical building, though, but building God's church. And I want to focus mainly on the passage and message in Haggai delivers in chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. But since the book is small, we're going to take a quick tour through the all through all of both of these chapters to see the, the lay of the land. Throughout the Old Testament, Israel 
had a poor track record in responding to the Lord in obedience. But this time, <laughs> for some reason, uh, upon hearing Haggai's words, they obey. It's a fascinating story. So let's go to Haggai. Um, <clears throat> if you'd like, uh, turn in your Bibles if you haven't already to um, Haggai chapter 1. <clears throat> Okay, Haggai chapter one, verse one. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, that would be uh, August 28th in our calendar, uh, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, uh, son of Shittil, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jodzak, the high priest. So the year is now 520 BC. King Cyrus, the Persian, has passed away. King Darius is now king. Zerubbabel, that name is very important. He's governor in Jerusalem. He is of the lineage of the kings. He's a descendant of David and, and an ancestor of Jesus Christ. Uh, this person, Joshua, is the current high priest in Israel. Uh, 49,000 sorry, Jews had come back to the to Israel, the promised land, about 18 years earlier. They'd started on the temple reconstruction, but quit because of that opposition. They lost heart. Haggai chapter 1, starting in verse 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Notice the phrases that's in there. This is what the Lord says. The word of the Lord. Phrases are like that are repeated 21 times in the, in the 38 verses of this book. Clearly, the Lord wants Israel to know that Haggai's words are messages from God. Verse 4. It is a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin. Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. And here's what God is saying. He's saying, think, people. You live in nice houses, but the Lord's house, this temple, is still in ruins 70 years after it was destroyed. 20 years, 18 years after you returned. Verse 6, you have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I might take pleasure in it and honor says the Lord. It had been 18 years of doing nothing. And so the Lord simply says, give careful thought to your ways. Get this job done for my sake. And something that should have been obvious was not. For 18 years, they had struggled to grow crops. They didn't have adequate clothing. They lost wages. And all of this should have been some kind of a sign to the Jews that a key part of God's covenant to Israel was not being fulfilled. That, that covenant that had been given through Moses some 900 years before that was that if the people obeyed God and followed the Lord, they would be overflowing with prosperity. But if they were disobedient and rebellious, he would bring curses on them and the land and they would suffer for it. And Haggai is now telling them this obvious truth. You are suffering because you are being rebellious. You're not building the house of God. So think. Consider your ways. Get busy and build the temple. God's pleasure and honor is at stake here. Throw off all of your excuses and start doing what is right. Now, I can relate to that. Over the years, I've used many excuses at various times to not do what is right. Oh, it's too hard. I'm too tired. I'm afraid. In verses 9 through 11 of Haggai 1, Haggai repeats the problem. It won't get better until you repent. Verse 9, you expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. 
Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens will have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces on people and livestock and all and on all the labor of your hands. And then, and then there's this surprising, but I think beautiful response of the people in Haggai chapter one, starting in verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shittil, Joshua, son of Jodzak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord, their God, and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord, their God, had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message to the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shittil, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jodzak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. Their response is beautiful. The leaders and the people are determined to obey. And I love verse 13 here. In verse 13, God graciously promises, I am with you. I have not abandoned you. I am with you and for you. You won't walk alone. He longs to be their God and have them be his people again. I love that statement. I am with you. You know, I think on a human level, we all deep down cry out for someone to be with us to defend us, to love us, to protect us, and be by our side. And we long for this from our parents, from our spouse, from our friends, from our church. How much more beautiful and how much better it is when God declares in his word, I am with you. More than 50 times throughout the Bible, God says, I am with you. In almost every case, he says it when his people are afraid or they're facing an overwhelming situation. I think one of those crucial times in history is when Jesus is ready to ascend to heaven and he gives a, a mammoth task to therefore go and make disciples of all nations. And he concludes this great commission with, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This beautiful, but I, I think overwhelming task of making disciples of all nations has been given to us, but, but we can't do it on our own. And Jesus here promises, he guarantees that he will be right there with us to the very end of time. And I think it's that same uh, assurance that God gave to Israel in this overwhelming task of rebuilding this temple, a task that would, was very, very expensive and would take them five years to complete. To know that God was with them was enough. God was enough. One more thing to point out in chapter one in verse 14, it says, the Lord stirred up the spirit of, uh, of Zerubbabel, the governor, and Joshua, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people. This word that, that is translated here, stirred up, uh, uh, means he, literally he aroused them from their slumber. They were spiritually asleep, and the Lord woke them up. He stirred up their spirit. Haggai hey, yeah, chapter 2 verses one through nine. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. This is now mid-October, a month after they began constructing the temple. He says uh, in verse two, speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shittil, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jozak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? 
does it not seem to you like nothing? You know, there were there were a few people among the people who were old enough that were still alive 66 years earlier when Solomon's temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. Remember, many had been sent in exile. Many had been killed when the Babylonians conquered them. So there weren't a lot of people who remembered the old temple, but there were some. They had, they had seen that original temple with its breathtaking beauty and, and glory. And now they are looking at this new temple. And I'll be honest, it looks dismal in comparison. Absolutely, some of them lost heart. So much work to build it. So much resources were needed. And it wasn't anywhere near as beautiful as the one in Solomon's day. And so in verses four through nine, the Lord gives them a charge. Here's what he says. He says, but now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jodzak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace declares the Lord Almighty. I love that. Be strong, leaders. Be strong, people. Do the work I have set before you. I will not fail you. My Holy Spirit remains in your midst. Stop being afraid. And because of my presence, the future glory of this temple will be greater than the past glory of Solomon's temple. Then we jump ahead a couple of months to Haggai chapter 2, starting in verse 10. On the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. So this is now three and a half months or so after the reconstruction of the temple began. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priests what the law says. If someone carries consecrated meat in the fold of their garment and that fold touches some bread or stew, some wine or olive oil or other food, does it become consecrated? If you if you have something that's consecrated and it touches something that's not consecrated, will it become consecrated? The priest answered no. Then Hagi, I said, if a person is defiled by contact with a dead body, touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Yes, says the priest, it becomes defiled. Then Haggai said, so it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. And his point here is that holiness is not some automatic thing. They have not been walking in holiness in the past. And so all of the deeds they're done, even though they're, they're, they're doing them for a good reason, are unholy. Pick up, picking up in verse 15. Now give careful thought to this from this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the temple of the Lord. When anyone came to a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. When anyone came to, when anyone went to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there was only 20. I struck all the work of your hand with blight and mildew and hail, yet you did not return to me declares the Lord. From this day on, from this 24th day of the ninth month, give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. Is there any seed left in the barn? Until now, the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit. But from this day on, I will bless you. As he did in chapter one, three months earlier, God asked the people again to consider where they have been and what is to come. Where have they been? Due to their rebellion, God had thwarted their crops, hindering even survival. 
their barns are empty. Where are they going? Well, because now they're walking with him. All that will change. The last sentence here in verse 19 promises that God's blessings will now rain down on them. After 900 years of pretty consistent rebellion against the Lord since the day of Moses, the people can see that God is still faithful to his covenant. If they humble themselves and repent, he will bless them once again. This last short section in Haggai chapter 2, I think, um, is looking forward and is, I think, is pointing to the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Listen to what he says in Haggai chapter uh, 2, uh, verses 20 and following. He says, the word of the Lord came again to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers. Horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shittil, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. You know, in 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 the in a coming day when the Lord shakes the heavens and the earth, he he brings down the nations. He's going to rise up a ruler over all the world. And and here in Haggai, he speaks to Zerubbabel as if he will be that man. And and perhaps Zerubbabel thought that. But but as we look back, we now know the Lord was speaking of not of Zerubbabel himself. <clears throat> but of Zerubbabel's descendant, Jesus Christ. Matthew 1, 12 to 13, tells us the genealogy of Jesus Christ, which includes Zerubbabel. Some people wonder why Matthew spends time at the very beginning of his book giving us the genealogy of Jesus but I think it's for this very reason, so that we can see Jesus' lineage back to the kings of Israel, back to Zerubbabel, back to King David himself. And Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament, including here in Haggai. This ruler was made was, will be made like a signet ring. Throughout the Old Testament, a, a signet ring was a ring symbolizing power and authority. A ruler would have a ring on his hand, and he would uh, seal documents with wax and then impress into that wax his ring. And that signet ring had the full power of the owner of that ring. This ruler was Haggai, that Haggai is talking about, Jesus, will have the full power of the Lord God Almighty. So whenever we read scriptures, we look for the meaning of the text. We've done that this morning. And then we should ask ourselves, how does this apply to our lives today? If I were to summarize the main part of Haggai's message to the people, I think it would be this. Consider your lives. Be strong. Do the work. The Lord is with you. These four messages are repeated multiple times to Israel throughout the scriptures. And we don't have to go far in the Bible in either direction, Old Testament or New Testament, to find these messages. Israel's experiences are not unique to humanity, nor even to us in the church today. So let me expand on these four points. First, let's consider our lives. Consider our lives, our hearts, and the Lord himself. Are we obeying God or are we half-hearted using excuses? The people of Israel had excuses for 18 years while they busied themselves with their own agenda. Disobedience, like Israel had, can make us spiritually sleepy. And like Israel, we need to the Lord to stir up our spirits to awaken us from our slumber. The Apostle Paul's words to the church in Rome 
are good for us. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. If you're a follower of the King of Kings, pray that God would stir up your heart like he did with the people of Jerusalem to arouse you from your slumber. Fortunately, God's word is at the core of rousing us awake. And so we must somehow and in some way expose our lives to the truth of God in his word. First, we need to pray, Lord, am I spiritually asleep in any way but don't know it? Please wake me from my slumber. And even if we, we think we are awake, we can always ask God to make us more awake. Kind of like the official who came to Jesus and Jesus asked him if he believed that Jesus could help him. And the man replied, I do believe. Help me in my unbelief. I'm awake, but help me be more awake. Second, we need to, to read God's word each day. Remember, Haggai said dozens of times in, in this short book, the word of the Lord, the Lord declares. If you're not reading the Bible at all now, simply open it today. Pray, Lord, I want to know you. Help me. Then read a chapter. Tomorrow, do the same. The Navigators Ministry has a read through the New Testament in the year program called Five by Five by Five, where you read five minutes a day, basically a chapter, and five days a week. So if you miss a day, you can catch up during the other two days. They also give you five ways of digging into that scripture a little deeper, like highlighting keywords or phrases or putting the passage into your own words. And I encourage you to, to, to maybe get one of those um, reading plans and go through them during the year. Third, uh, be part of a small group of Christians to read and study the Bible together. Take the opportunity to meet with others for Bible study. We have a Wednesday evening uh, Zoom Bible study that is currently meeting that anywhere, anyone from anywhere in the world can join. Uh, and, and frankly, I'm willing to start other Bible studies any day, anytime, anywhere. Well, preferably somewhere with coffee and pastries, of course, but but really anytime, anywhere. Fourth, read good biographies of godly men and women. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Reading about faithful, godly men and women will help us follow God just as they did. I'm in the process of reading a biography by Eric, Eric Met, Met, Metaxas uh, on Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor and theologian who spoke out against the atrocities of Hitler during World War II and ended up being martyred in a concentration camp in 1945, just three weeks before the end of the war as the Nazi regime was collapsing. It's actually in our Lebanon County library system. So if you have a library card, you can check it out and read it free after I finish it and return it, of course. And, and frankly, as I'm reading it, I'm really getting excited to read some of Bonhoeffer's own writings and dig into those as well. We must consider our, our hearts in prayer. Are we spiritually asleep or are we awake? A second message to Israel we can say is to be strong. Find strength and courage in the Lord. Haggai's words from the Lord was to a people who for 16 years had said, we can't. And what they really meant was we won't. And, you know, we may relate to that excuse. They had opposition. Their task was huge. But where was the honor for the Lord in that? How did it please the Lord? The people were inadequate in then and, and of themselves. The Apostle Paul recognized that we Christians today can feel the same way. And so in 2 Corinthians 3, 5, he told them, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. 
Paul was entrusted with his ministry of doing work for Jesus Christ. He knew within himself he was not sufficient. He didn't have what it took. But he found that Jesus in him and for him and with him was more than enough. The point for us is not whether I personally have what it takes. The real point is this. Do I believe that God has what it takes? Is he enough for me? And we can find strength because God is enough. A third message from the Lord to Israel was do the work. Whatever God has set before us, we should do with our whole heart. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Whatever God, work God has set before us, we work for him first and foremost. He is our top boss. Not the guy at work, not me as pastor, not our parents. Even if you're a business owner, God is the true owner. We have many kinds of work God will set before us. Caring for our families, working in our jobs, our school, obeying our parents, giving money, evangelizing, serving our community, helping a neighbor. Are we doing the work God has set before us with a whole heart? To please an audience of one, the only one we should be pleasing is God himself. A fourth message to the Lord to Israel was, believe he is with you. Twice Haggai's words to the people was, the Lord is with you. The Lord is here. He is not absent. He is not disinterested. He was right there with them, going in front and going behind them. And he's here with us today. If you are a Christian, if you have believed in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you are guaranteed the presence, the protection, and the provision of God Almighty. God's spirit lives inside you. We have something greater than what Israel had. The Lord is with us personally through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me wrap this up. Uh, like Israel in 520 BC, we can lose heart and grow spiritually sleepy. But God assures us that whatever we do by faith, it matters. Our work is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my brothers, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That chapter in here in Corinthians is all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the great descendant of Zerubbabel, promised centuries ago. This king has risen from the dead and will never die again. We too, through our faith in the risen Lord, will rise from the dead into everlasting glory. Because of this, all we do for the Lord matters. It is not in vain. It matters now, and it matters into eternity. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, we come before you amazed at the, what you've given to us. And Lord, we pray that we are not asleep. And if we are, wake us from our slumber. Put us to the task of growing your kingdom here on earth. Yeah, we're not building a physical building now. We are building your church. Help us to reach out to our community, to our neighbors, to our friends, to our families. We praise you that you are always with us. And we rely and trust that everything we do for you is not in vain. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.